I have two things in my pocket. And with these two things, I would like to tell you a story, our story. So the first thing is this car parking ticket. The timestamp on this ticket is 12.09 p.m. My sister Sharon and I were doing errands in the Westlands area, and our final errand brought us to the Westgate shopping mall. We couldn't decide if we wanted to park in the rooftop or in the basement. And I personally didn't mind getting into a hot car, but Annie at the time was pregnant. And I think we all know that the pregnant woman gets what she wants. <laughs> she wanted to park in the basement, we parked in the basement. Plus I was driving, so <laughs> <laughs> it was my call. The date on this parking ticket is the 21st of September, 2013. And it started out as the most ordinary of Saturdays. Hot sun, a lot of traffic, errands to do, just trying to finish up work so that we could carve out a small part of the weekend for ourselves. So Sharon and I go into the Nakumat supermarket. And actually, initially, we were in separate areas of the supermarket shopping, and I couldn't find what I was looking for. So I wandered back to where Sharon was. And not a moment after we reconnected, mayhem broke out in Nakomat. People were running in, screaming. And I remember seeing this lady in a green dress running towards me, and she crashed into a shelf. Things fell all over the floor, and she started to pick herself up and continue running. And I grabbed her arm and asked her, what is going on? And she said to me, don't you know that people are being killed outside? And I just thought, what? People are being killed outside. So I turned to Sharon, who hadn't heard the response. And Sharon asked me, what did she say? And I said, she says that people are being killed outside. And so I look at Sharon and I say, maybe we should run, let's escape. And she says, no, 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 Annie, we are going to hide and we're going to figure out what is happening and then we'll know what to do from there. You see, if we had run out of the supermarket, it likely would have put us in the direction of the gunmen. So I grabbed Annie's hand and we ran to the back of the supermarket where the book section was. Now, try hiding in a supermarket. The shelves are very narrow. You can't hide on top because you'll be exposed. You can't hide under because the space between the last shelf and the ground is very little. The place is full of fluorescent lights. So we find ourselves at the back of the supermarket and we see a little bookshelf and we dive behind it. Now everything that we have talked about up until this point happens in a matter of seconds. And then in another few seconds, we go from being just the two of us to about 10 or 11 of us, all of us hiding in this shelf that's about this high. The second thing I have in my pocket is a phone. So like all self-respecting Kenyans, I have two phones. <laughs> I have my smartphone for meetings. You know the one you put on the table because it looks nice. And then I have a Molika Mwizi. And this one is being held together with rubber bands and goodwill. <laughs> and so, earlier that morning, I had called my doctor. I was five months pregnant, it had been a difficult pregnancy, and I had gotten some blood work done. And he said, call me and, tell, and I'll tell you how the results are. So I had called him, and for the first time, he was cautiously optimistic. He said, sweetie, maybe 70-30, we will see this baby. And then the next call I made was to our mom, who was on her way to a Chama meeting. And we agreed that when we were done with what we were doing, and she was done with her meeting, we would have lunch together at 2 p.m. So isn't it funny how we make and commit to plans? We're having a baby in March. I'll have lunch with you at 2 p.m. Because we don't know that our lives can turn on a dime. But back to our story. So Sharon and I are hiding behind a shelf. And I take out my phone and I text our sister, Terry, who at the time was living in Mombasa. And I tell her, Terry, you know, we're in Nakumat. There's a lot of shooting. We don't know what's going on, but we're hiding. Pray. And then because it was a new phone and I was nervous, 
I not only switch it off, I take out the battery and I put it in my handbag. So, I like this one. I didn't turn off my phone. In fact, I never turn off my phone. Morning, noon, or night, you can find me. And if you can't find me, it's because I don't want to be found. <laughs> so, I start going through the people that I want to call, and the first person that I call is my dad. And I call him and he picks it up within the first ringtone because my sister Terry has already called him by then. And I start to tell him something. He says, Mommy, it's okay. My dad calls me mom, even if I'm not named for his mom. He says, Mommy, it's okay. I've heard and I'm praying for you and it's going to be okay. And then he starts to say something else, but the shooting begins and he can hear it and he knows that I can't talk. And so I just hang up the phone. So let me tell you about our dad, if he says he's praying for you. Hmm. In 1982, dad was flying his small Cessna aircraft and was about to land, and he lost an engine. And he tells us that he prayed to God and said, I'm not ready to meet you. <laughs> what I would like is to be home with my family for dinner tonight. And a few moments later, he crashes into the bush they rescue him, and dad was home for dinner. So when he says, I'm praying for you, I'm home. <laughs> so the second person that I try to call is my mom. Now, at the time, my mom had just discovered those Safari Komskiza tunes, and you know the tune she would have picked. So we're sitting here, and we're crouching, and I'm trying to call her, but it's so loud, this song on the phone, and Everyone's looking at me like, hey, we're hiding. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm just trying to call my mom. And we go to speak, but we, didn't, we weren't able to have a conversation because the shooting starts again. Later, my mom would tell us that that was one of the most difficult conversations not to have. Imagine your children are in a place where they face mortal danger, and there's nothing you can physically do to help them. But I tell you what she did. And you need to know my mom, she's a very quiet, very demure, soft-spoken lady. And she called the meeting to attention. And she told them to pray for us, and to pray for the people who we were with. And then, at some point, the emotion got so overwhelming for her. She grabbed her friend's hand and they went to the corner of the room. And at the time, she was actually due for a knee replacement surgery. And she knelt on this cold floor and she faced the wall and she just prayed for us. The next person I'll try to call after that is Terry, my sister. And by then, it was on the news, and so I could hear it in the background of where she was. And she'd ask me, how are you? What can you see? How is Annie? Are you guys okay? And the shooting starts again, and she can hear it. And she can hear that I've stopped speaking. And by then, she's crying, and she kept telling us, it's okay, girls. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. And she's crying on the phone, and I can hear her children have stopped fussing because they can hear that their mom is in distress. And she tells us it's going to be fine, and then I have to hang up the phone. So let me tell you a little bit about some of the people that we were hiding with that day. You know, we were in a, a very small space, hiding behind a very low shelf, and there were maybe 10 of us. And we were literally sitting on each other, cheek to jowl, sharing air, nothing like personal space. <laughs> and even in that high stress situation, people's personalities were shining through. <laughs> and so there was, there was this sweet Indian girl and she was the first person who got photos of what was happening on her phone. Um, you know, the massacre had started at the rooftop, and someone had sent her pictures. And so she passed her phone around, and we're looking at these pictures. And the terror sets in, because now we realize this is our situation. But afterwards, she puts her phone away, and she reached into the shelf behind her, and she pulled out a children's book. I think it was Dr. Seuss, the cat in the hat. And she sat there, and she just read it, <laughs> like she was in a cafe. 
And then there was an older Southeast Asian lady who was in front of me. And she kept on running out and looking and then coming back inside. <laughs> and she reminded me so much of, you've watched Meerkat Diaries, yeah? Or Nat Geo. You know how the scout meerkat comes out of the hole? And it looks, if there's an eagle or a snake, and then it goes back inside, she was exactly like that. And then there was an older gentleman with an East European accent, and he was pissed off <laughs> at everybody. <laughs> he was barking at all of us, and we didn't even know him. And, and then I was looking at Sharon from where I was, and I could see that she could hear our mom's voice in her head. Because you see, Sean was wearing a very short dress on that day. <laughs> and I think she could hear mommy saying, Mommy, that dress is so short. <laughs> mommy, it's like a blouse. <laughs> Are you going to wear trousers with that? <laughs> okay, at least stockings. And so Sharon was crouched in front of that mze with a bad temper. <laughs> and she kept pulling the back of her, <laughs> of her dress. <laughs> and maybe this is why he was so angry. <laughs> but you've all heard it said that there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. So let me tell you, for me, on that day, that friend was Sharon because at some point, this situation was overwhelming. Gunfire for hours on end does your head in. It's so loud. And at some point, there were explosions in different parts of the, of the mall, and the ground was shaking. And the ceiling above us was shaking and crumbling. And Sharon somehow found a way to move over to where I was and to tuck me underneath her body. Thank you. <laughs> um, tell them about the girl. Uh, and there was, sorry, one last person <laughs> who deserves mention. There was this Kikuyu girl who, from the moment we got there, giggled right through. <laughs> like she had a generator in her stomach. <laughs> And her giggles were interspersed with, Oi, Kai, Mwadali, Jesus. So after a few hours of this, Sharon says to me, Annie, do you know where the fresh vegetable section in the supermarket is? And I'm like, Vegetables. <laughs> Are you hungry, Sharon? <laughs> Are you going to fix this a salad? <laughs> Do you see how people talk to you when you're the fat one, eh? Mm. Mm. I mean, if I was trying to eat all my emotions at that time, I'd be looking for tea, bread, a chapati, <laughs> mandazi, maybe even chavda. Not salad. <laughs> But here's the other thing I can tell you. So I work as an interior designer. And a supermarket that's well designed, right in the center of it is where you keep the non-perishable goods. On the periphery of the supermarket is where you keep the fresh vegetables. Usually there's access to a cold room and there's access to a store. And, you know, you can find your way out. So that was my plan. But, of course, it wasn't going to happen that easily and we were there for such a long time. And it was so scary. And every time the shooting would start, I would start cursing. But I'm so glad that I had Annie there with me because every time it started to sh to, when they started shooting, she would say a prayer or she'd say a psalm and it kind of comforted us. You know, when we were younger, my parents always used to tell us, especially when you're having a hard time, they would say, Mommy, encourage yourself. So that used to really frustrate me because if I go to you for help, I'm <laughs> wanting help. And being told, encourage yourself, is like, what's that? You know? 
But I realized, I guess in retrospect, that every time that she said these words, it comforted us and it spoke to us, and it spoke to us in that situation. And I guess that's what they mean when they say encourage yourself. The Psalmist David in Psalm 91 says, the Lord is my refuge. Surely he will hide you under his feathers and under his wings you will find cover. You shall not be afraid of the terror that comes at night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in the noontime or the destruction that lays waste in the noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 by your right side, but it shall not come near to you. And you know, there was at least two times that I know that we could see one of the gunmen really clearly peering between the shelves. And we could see him walking, stalking the aisles ahead of us. We could see his gun, we could see his bullet belt, his boots, his torso. And he couldn't see us. And we were hiding in plain sight, not 20 feet away from him. Well, after several hours, the fighting moved out of the Nakomat where we were, and it went to, we were on the ground floor, went to the other floors. And so, together with the other people who we were hiding with, we thought, this is as good a time as any to try and make our escape. And so, we prepared to escape. We were both in strappy sandals, so we took off our shoes, wiggled our toes, trying to get blood moving in our feet again. Mm. And, and that giggly kikuyu girl, she stopped and took a selfie. <laughs> yep, true story. We cannot make this up. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> we started to crouch and hide and run between shelves, all the while crouching, ducking, sometimes on our hands and knees. And there was a lot of blood on the floor. There was broken glass. There was flour. There was other people's shoes. There was spent cartridges. And there are no words to tell you how horrible those few minutes were. So, as we were heading out, we realized that we weren't the only ones who were trying to leave. It was, there was a, like a, there was a silent mass exodus out of the supermarket. I remember seeing a really tall gentleman with a tiny baby. I remember seeing two Indian ladies and one was hurt and she was helping her friend out. And as we were moving out in this mass of people quietly, out of the supermarket and out of the mall, in this crowd of people who just want to get out of there, I remember seeing a figure coming into the mall as we're pushing out. And as we got closer and closer to this person, I realized that I knew the face. And I grabbed Annie's hand and I'm like, Annie, that's dad. My dad was coming to the mall to look for us. And he had spent quite a bit of time trying to get in. By that time, the security forces had surrounded the mall and no one was allowed in. And he was like, I need to go in there. And they would tell him, ah, mzee hapana. Apa, hawe zingia. He say, yes, naelewa. Lakini wasichana wangu, wakondani. My girls are inside, and I need to go and get them. And that's just, that's our dad. That's the man that our dad is. Mm -hmm. You know, he told us about a week later, when my parents had a Thanksgiving dinner at home, that he was in his office watching the live coverage on the telly and knowing that his girls were there. And he said a prayer. He said, God, I need to go in and get my girls. And I know that you can do big things. Today, I just want you to do a small thing. Just make it easy. When I go there, just bring them to me. And that's what happened. By the time that we were leaving, our phones were off. He didn't know where we were. We didn't know he was coming. And we just found each other because he came for us armed with nothing other than a prayer. And that has the heart of a lion. You know, I think it's easy for us to paint a picture of our family 
like we are the perfect family, like those ones on the blue band commercials on TV. <laughs> as if we, we sit around the table smiling at each other for no reason, as we <laughs> hand each other slices of white bread. <laughs> and for the most part, this is true. <laughs> But then we're also like every family. We have our moments when we're not getting along. We had come, this was at the back of two years of attrition and long silences and we weren't really getting along so well. And our mom, she was brokering peace deals all the time <laughs> between us, you know, playing the devil's advocate. Whoever the devil was on a particular day, um, because the devil has rotating membership. <laughs> and if mom had not done this for us, if she hadn't kept us together, I don't know that we could have been pulling for each other the way that we did on that day, when there was a crisis. You know, this is it's actually not an easy story to tell, because it's not lost on us that there were other people in that mall who just like us were going about there every day, and they never made it. There were others who survived the event, but were left with physical injuries. There were other women who were pregnant at the time, just like Annie, who never, get to, who never got a chance to enjoy their children the way I see Annie enjoying her children. So, I have two things in my heart. The first one is a souvenir that is given to people who have survived tragic or traumatic events. You see, most of you guys go into a supermarket, you park your car, you get in, you get out without a second thought. But the souvenir that is given to people who have survived a difficult event is that it changes your perception in life and it informs it in a different way. But the other thing that I have is this gift that I didn't even know that I had until we had to call on it. Our parents, in raising us in comfort, also built into us resilience. And it's something that I didn't realize that we had until we needed it. So I'm, I'm grateful for my Westgate experience, mm. because as a psychotherapist, it has given me a knowledge of anxiety and fear that no book can give me. I am familiar with these emotions because I have lived in close quarters with them. And when someone comes to me, having lived through trauma, I am able to extend to them true empathy because I've been there. And I can tell them genuinely that you can find it in yourself. You can call deep on your courage and face life again. So, you remember I told you this phone has a special part in this story. Mm. About a week after the whole Westgate thing was over, the management called Sharon to go pick up the car. And this good old faithful Mulika was still on, even though it had over a hundred missed calls. And so many messages from people, many whom we didn't even know, but whom our family had reached out to. And they sent us credit, they sent us texts of encouragement, and what it did for me was that it gave me a new purpose in that I want to be that person that you can call about your loved one who is in a situation, and whether or not I know them, that I will be able to pray for them and ask heaven to do for them what it did for me.